Chapters fifty four through fifty seven of the Right Away by Gilbert Parker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter fifty four. Emra Signal slips the leash. It was the last day of the Passion Play, and the great dramatic mission was drawing to a close. The confidence of the curé in the Seigneur was restored. The prohibition against strangers had had its effect, and for three whole days the valley had been at rest again. Apparently there was not a stranger within its borders, save the Seigneur's brother, the Abbey Resignol, who had come to see the moving spectacle. The Abbey, on his arrival, had made inquiries concerning the tailor of Chaudier and Joe Portugais, as persistently about the one as the other. Their secrets had been kept inviolate by him. It was disconcerting to hear the tales people told of the tailor's charity and wisdom. It was all dangerous, for what was, accidentally, no evil in this particular instance, might be the greatest disaster in another case. Principle was at stake. He heard in stern silence the curé's happy statement that Joe Portugais had returned to the bosom of the church and attended mass regularly. "'So it may be, my dear Abbey,' said M. Loisel, "'that the friendship between him and our infidel has been the means of helping Portugais. I hope their friendship will go on unbroken for years and years.' "'I have no idea that it will,' said the Abbey grimly. "'That rope of friendship may snap untimely.' "'Upon my soul you croak like a raven,' testily broke in Emra Signal, who was present. "'I didn't know there was so much in common between you and my surly-jowled groom. He gets his pleasure out of croaking. Wait, wait, you'll see, you'll see. Death, 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 every man must die. The devil has you by the hair. Death, death, death. Bah! I'm heartily sick of croakers. I suppose, like my grunting groom, you'll say about the passion play, no good will come of it. Wait, wait, wait. Bah! It may not be an unmixed good, answered the ascetic. Well, and is there any such thing on earth as an unmixed good? The play yesterday was worth a thousand sermons. It was meant to serve Holy Church, and it will serve it. Was there ever anything more real and touching than Paulette Dubois as Mary Magdalene yesterday? I do not approve of such reality." For that woman to play the part is to destroy the impersonality of the scene. You would demand that the Christus should be a good man and a St. John blameless. Why shouldn't the Magdalene be a repentant woman? It might impress the people more if the best woman in your parish were to play the part. The fall of virtue, the ruin of innocence, would be vividly brought home. It does good to make the innocent feel the terror and shame of sin. That is the price the good pay for the fall of man sorrow and shame for those who sin. The Signor, rising quickly from the table and kicking his chair back, said angrily, "'Damn your theories!' Then, seeing the frozen look on his brother's face, continued more excitedly, "'Yes, damn, damn, damn your theories! You always took the crass view. I beg your pardon, curé, I beg your pardon.' He then went to the window, threw it open, and called to his groom. "'Here, there, coffin-face,' he said bring round the horses, the quietest one in the stable for my brother, you hear? He can't ride, he added maliciously. This was his fiercest stroke, for the Abbey's secret vanity was the belief that he looked well on a horse, and rode handsomely. End of chapter 54 Chapter 55 Rosalie Plays a Part From a tree upon a little hill rang out a bell, a deep tone bell, bought by the parish years before for the missions held at this very spot. Every day it rang for an instant at the beginning of each of the five acts. It also tolled slowly when the curtain rose upon the scene of the crucifixion. In this act no one spoke save the abased Magdalene, who knelt at the foot of the cross and on whose hair red drops fell when the Roman soldier pierced the side of the figure on the cross. This had been the curé's idea. The Magdalene should speak for mankind, for the continuing world. She should speak for the broken and contrite heart in all ages, should be the first fruits of the sacrifice, a flower of the desert earth bedewed by the blood of the Prince of Peace. So, in the long nights of the late winter and early spring, 
the cure had thought and thought upon what the woman should say from the foot of the cross. At last he put into her mouth that which told the whole story of redemption and deliverance, so far as his heart could conceive it, the prayer for all sorts and conditions of men, and the general thanksgiving of humanity. During the last three days Paulette Dubois had taken the part of Mary Magdalene. As Joe Portugais had confessed to the Abbey that notable day in the woods at Padrome Mountain, so she had confessed to the curé after so many years of agony, and the one confession fitted into the other. Joe had once loved her. She had treated him vilely, then a man had wronged her, and Joe had avenged her. This was the tale in brief. She it was who laughed in the gallery of the courtroom the day that Joseph Nadeau was acquitted. It had pained and shocked the curé more than any he had ever heard, but he urged for her no penalty as Portugais had set for himself with the austere approval of the Abbey. Paulette's presence as the Magdalene had had a deep effect upon the people, so that she shared with Mary the mother the painfully real interest of the vast audience. Five times had the bell rung out in the perfect spring air upon which the balm of the forest and the refreshment of the ardent sun were poured. The quick anger of Emre Signal had passed away long before the curé, the abbey, and himself had reached the lake and the great plateau. Between the acts the two brothers walked up and down together, at peace once more, and there was a suspicious moisture in the seigneur's eyes. The demeanor of the people had been so humble and rapt that the place and the plateau and the valley seemed alone in creation with the lofty drama of the ages. The curé's eyes shone when he saw on a little knoll in the trees, apart from the worshippers and spectators, Charlie and Joe Portugais. His cup of content was now full. He had felt convinced that if the tailor had but been within these bounds during the past three days, a work were begun which should end only at the altar of their parish church. Today the play became to him the engine of God for the saving of a man's soul. Not long before the last great tableau was to appear, he went to his own little tent near the hut where the actors prepared to go upon the stage. As he entered, someone came quickly forward from the shadow of the trees and touched him on the arm. Rosalie, he cried in amazement, for she wore the costume of Mary Magdalene. It is I, not Paulette who will appear, she said, a deep light in her eyes. You, Rosalie, he asked, dumbfounded, you are distraught. Trouble and sorrow have put this in your mind. You must not do it. Yes, I am going there, she said, pointing towards the great stage. Paulette has given me these to wear, she touched the robe, and I only ask your blessing now. Oh, believe, believe me, I can speak for those who are innocent and those who are guilty for those who pray and those who cannot pray, for those who confess and those who dare not. I can speak the words out of my heart with gladness and agony, Monsieur, she urged in a voice vibrating with feeling. A luminous look came into the curé's face. A thought leapt up in his heart. Who could tell? This poor girl, speaking for the whole sinful, unbelieving and believing world, might be the one last conquering argument to the man. He could not read the agony of spirit which had driven Rosalie to this, to confess through the words of Mary Magdalene her own woe, to say it out to all the world, and to receive, as did Paulette Dubois, every day after the curtain came down, absolution and blessing. She longed for the old remembered peace. The curé could not read the struggle between her love for a man and the ineradicable habit of her soul, but he raised his hand made the sacred gesture over her, and said, Go, my child, and God be with you. He could not see her for tears as she hurried away to where Paulette Dubois awaited her, the two at peace now. At the hands of the lately despised and injurious woman, Rosalie was made ready to play the part in the last act, none knowing save the few who appeared in the final tableau, and they at the last moment only. The bell began to toll. A thousand people fell upon their knees, and with fascinated yet abashed and awestruck eyes saw the great tableau of Christendom, 
the three crosses against the evening sky, the figure in the center, the Roman populace, the trembling Jews, the pathetic groups of disciples. A cloud passed across the sky, the illusion grew, and hearts quivered in piteous sympathy. There was no music now, not a sound save the sob of some overwrought woman. The woe of an oppressed world absorbed them. Even stolid Indians, as Roman soldiers, shrank awe-stricken from the sacred tragedy. Now the eyes of all were upon the central figure. Then they shifted for a moment to John the Beloved, standing with the mother. Pov mur, pov Christ, said a weeping woman aloud. A Roman soldier raised the spear and pierced the sight of the hero of the world. Blood flowed, and hundreds gasped. Then there was silence, a strange hush as of a prelude to some great event. It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, said the figure. The hush was broken by such a sound as one hears in a forest when a wind quivers over the earth flutters the leaves, and then sinks away, neither having come nor gone, but only lived and died. Again there was silence, and then all eyes were fixed upon the figure at the foot of the cross, Mary the Magdalene. Day after day they had seen this figure rise, come forward a step, and speak the epilogue to this moving miracle drama. For the last three days Paulette Dubois had turned a sorrowful face upon them, and with one hand upraised had spoken the prayer, the prophecy, the thanksgiving, the appeal of humanity, and the ages. They looked to see the same figure now, and waited. But as the Magdalene turned, there was a great stir in the multitude, for the face bent upon them was that of Rosalie Evanturel. Awe and wonder moved the people. Apart from the crowd, under a clump of trees, knelt a woodsman from Vadrome Mountain, and the tailor of Chaudier stood beside him. When Charlie, touched by the heavy scene, saw the figure of the Magdalene rise, he felt a curious thrill of fascination. When she turned, and he saw the face of Rosalie, the blood rushed to his face. Then his heart seemed to stand still. Pain and shame traveled to the farthest recesses of his nature. Joe Portugais rose to his feet with a startled exclamation. Rosalie began to speak. This is the day of which the hours shall never cease. In it there shall be no night. He whom you have crucified hath saved you from the wrath to come. He has saved others, himself he would not save. Even for such as I, who have secretly opened, who have secretly entered the doors of sin, with a gasp of horror and a mad desire to take her away from the sight of this gasping, fascinated crowd, Charlie made to rush forward but Joe Portugais held him back. "'Be still, you will ruin her, Monsieur," said Joe. "'Even for such as I am,' the beautiful voice went on, "'hath he died. And in the ages to come, women such as I, and all women who sorrow, and all men who err and are deceived, and all the helpless world, will know that this was the friend of the human soul. Not a gesture, not a movement, only that slight pathetic figure with pale, agonized face, and eyes that looked, looked, looked beyond them, over their heads to the darkening east, the clouded light of the evening behind her. Her voice rang out now valiant and clear, now searching and piteous, yet reaching to where the farthermost person knelt, and was lost upon the lake and in the spreading trees. What ye have done may never be undone. What he hath said shall never be unsaid. His is the word which shall unite all languages, when ye that are Romans shall be no more Romans, and ye that are Jews shall still be Jews, reproached and alone. No longer shall men faint in the glare, the shadow of the cross shall screen them. No more shall women bear her black sorrows alone, the light of the world shall cheer her. As she spoke, the cloud drew back from the sunset and the saffron glow behind lighted the cross and shone upon her hair, casting her face in a gracious shadow. Her voice rose higher. I, the Magdalene, am the first fruits of this sacrifice. From the foot of this cross I come. I have sinned more than all. I have shamed all women. But I have confessed my sin, and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Her voice now became lower, but clear and even, pathetically exulting. O world, forgive, as he hath forgiven you. Fall, dark curtain, and hide this pain, and rise again upon forgiven sin and a redeemed people. She stood still, with her eyes upraised, and the curtain came slowly down. For a long time no one in all the gathered multitude stirred. Far over under the trees a man sat upon the ground, his head upon his arms, and his arms upon his knees, in a misery unmeasurable. Beside him stood a woodsman, who knew of no word to say that might comfort him. A girl in the garb of the Magdalene entered the tent of the curé, and speaking no word, knelt and received absolution of her sins. End of chapter 55 Chapter 56 Mrs. Flynn Speaks Charlie left Joe Cordigay behind and went home alone. He watched at a window till he saw Rosaline return. As she passed quickly down the street with Mrs. Flynn to her own door, he observed that her face was happier than he had seen it for many a day. Her step was lighter, there was a freedom in her air, a sense of confidence in her carriage. She bore herself as one who had done a thing which relaxed a painful tension. There was a curious glow in her eyes and face, and this became deeper as, showing himself at the door, she saw him, smiled, and stood still. He came across the street and took her hand. "'You have been away,' she said softly. "'For a few days,' he answered. "'Far?' at Vadrome Mountain. "'You have missed these last days of the Passion Play,' she said, a shadow in her eyes. "'I was present to-day,' he answered. She turned away her head quickly, for the look in his eyes told her more than any words could have done, and Mrs. Flynn said, "'Tis a day for everlasting memory, sir. For the part she played this day, the darling only such as she could play. Tis the innocent taketh the shame of the guilty, and the tears do be coming to me eyes. Tis not old witty Flynn's eyes alone that's wet this day, but hearts do be weeping for the love of God. Rosalie suddenly opened the door, and without another look at Charlie, entered the house. Tis one in a million, said Mrs. Flynn, in a confidential tone, for she had a fixed idea that Rosalie loved Charlie, and that he loved her, and that the only thing that stood in the way of their marriage was religion. From the first Charlie had conquered Mrs. Flynn. That he was a tailor was a pity and a shame, but love was love, and the man had a head on him and a heart in him, and love was love. So Mrs. Flynn said, "'Tis one that a man that's a man should do anything for, was it having the heart cut out of him, or given the last drop of his blood. Sure for such as her, murder, or false witness, or given up the last wish, or thought a man hugged to his bosom would be as easy as easy. Charlie laughed to himself. Her purpose was so obvious, but his heart went out to her, for she was a friend, and whatever came to him, Rosalie would not be alone. "'I believe every word of yours,' he said, shaking her hand, "'and we'll see, you and I, that no man marries her who isn't ready to do what you say. "'Would you do it for yourself, if it was you?' she asked, flushing for her boldness. "'I would,' he answered. "'Then do it,' she said, and fled inside the house and shut the door. "'Mrs. Flynn, good Mrs. Flynn,' he said, and went back sadly to his house, and shut himself up with his thoughts. When night drew on he went to bed, but he could not sleep. He got up after a time, and taking pen and paper, wrote for a long time. Having finished, he took what he had written, and placing it with the two packets of money and pearls which he had brought from his old home, he addressed it to the curé, and going to the safe in the wall of the shop, placed him inside and locked the door. Then he went to bed, and slept soundly, the deep sleep of the just. End of chapter 56 Chapter 57 A Burning Fiery Furnace Every man within the limits of the parish was in his bed, save one. He was a stranger who, once before, had visited Chaudier for one brief day, 
when he had been saved from death at the Red Ravine, and had fled the village that night because, as he thought, he had heard the voice of his old friend's ghost in the trees. Since that time he had travelled in many parishes, healing where he could, entertaining where he might, earning money as the charlatan. He was now on his way back through the parishes to Montreal, and his route lay through Chaudier. He had hoped to reach Chaudier before nightfall. He remembered with fear the incident from which he had fled many months before. But his horse had broken its leg on a corduroy bridge a few miles out from the parish in the hills, and darkness came upon him before he could hide his wagon in the woods and proceed afoot to Chaudier. He had shot his horse and rolled it into the swift torrent beneath the bridge. Traveling the lonely road, he drank freely from the whiskey horn he carried to keep his spirits up, so that by the time he came to the outskirts of Chaudier he was in a state of intoxication and reeled impudently along with the Dutch courage the liquor had given him. Arrived at the first cluster of houses in the place, he paused uncertain. Should he knock here or go on to the tavern? He shivered at the thought of the tavern, for it was near it he had heard Charlie Steele's voice calling to him out of the trees. If he knocked here, would the people admit him in his present state? He had sense enough to know that he was very drunk. As he shook his head in owlish gravity, he saw the church on the hill not far away. He chuckled to himself. The carpet in the chancel and the hassocks at the altar would make a good bed. No fear of Charlie's ghost coming inside the church. It wouldn't be that kind of a ghost. As he traveled the intervening space, shrugging his shoulders, staggering serenely, he told himself in confidence that he would leave the church at dawn, go to the tavern, purchase a horse as soon as might be, and get back to his wagon. The church door was unlocked, and he entered and made his way to the chancel, found surplices in the vestry, and put a hassock inside one for a pillow. Then he sat down and drew the loose rug of the chancel floor over him, and took another drink from the whiskey horn. Lighting his pipe he smoked for a while, but grew drowsy, and his pipe fell into his lap. With eyes nearly shut he struck another match, made to light his pipe again, but threw the match away, still burning. As he did so the pipe dropped again from his mouth, and he fell back on the hassock pillow he had made. The lighted match fell on a surplice which had dropped from his arms as he came from the vestry and set it afire. In five minutes the whole chancel was burning, and the sleeping man waked in the midst of smoke and flame. He staggered to his feet with a terror-stricken cry, stumbled down the aisle, through the front door, and out into the night. Reaching the road he turned his face again to the hill where his wagon lay hid. If he could reach that, he would be safe, nobody would suspect him. He clutched the whiskey horn tight and broke into a run. As he passed beyond the village his excited imagination heard Charlie Steele's ghost calling after him. He ran harder. The voice kept calling from Chaudier. Not Charlie's voice, but the voices of many people in Chaudier were calling. Some wakeful person had seen the glare in the church windows and had given the alarm, and now there rang through the streets the call, Fire! fire fire charlie and joe were among the last to wake for both had slept soundly but joe was roused by a handful of gravel thrown at his window and a warning cry and a few moments later he and charlie were in the street with a hurrying crowd over all the village was a red glare lighting up the sky burnishing the trees the church was a mass of flames charlie was as pale as the rest of the crowd for he thought of the cure he thought of this people to whom their church meant more than home and vastly more than friend and fortune. His heart was with them all, not because it was their church that was burning, but because it was something dear to them. Reaching the hill he saw the curé coming from the vestry of the burning church, bearing some vessels of the altar. Depositing them in the arms of his weeping sister, he turned again towards the door. People clung to him and would not let him go. See, it is all in flames, they cried. Your cassock is singed. You shall not go. At that moment Charlie and Portugais came up. A hurried question to the curé from Charlie, a key handed over, a nod from Joe, and before the curé could prevent them the two men had rushed through the smoke and flame into the vestry, Portugais holding Charlie's hand. 
the crowd outside waited in a terrible anxiety the timbers of the chancel portion of the building seemed about to fall and still the two men did not appear the people called the cure clinched his hands at his side he was too fearful even to pray but now the two men appeared loaded with a few treasures of the church they were scorched and singed and the beards of both were burned but stumbling and exhausted they brought their loads to the eager arms of the waiting habitants then from the other end of the church came a cry the little cross the little iron cross then another cry rosalie of Anturel! rosalie of Anturel! someone came running to the cure rosalie of Anturel has gone inside for the little cross on the pillar she is in the flames the door has fallen in she can't get out again with a hoarse cry charlie darted back inside the vestry door a cry of horror went up it was only a minute and a half but it seemed like years and then a man in flames appeared in the fiery porch and not alone he carried a girl in his arms he wavered even at the threshold with the timber swaying overhead but with a last effort he plunged forward through the furnace and was caught by eager hands on the margin of endurable heat the two were smothered in quilts brought from the cure's house and carried swiftly to the cool safety of the grass and trees beyond the woman had fainted in the flame of the church the man dropped insensible as they caught her from his arms as they tore away charlie's coat muffling his face and opened his shirt they stared in awe the cross which rosalie had torn from the pillar charlie had thrust into his bosom and there it now lay on the red scar made by itself in the hands of louis trudel m loisel waved the people back he raised charlie's head the abbe rossignol who had just arrived with the seigneur lifted the cross from the insensible man's breast he started when he saw the scar then he remembered the tale he had heard he turned away gravely to his brother was it the cross or the woman he went for he asked great god do you ask the seigneur said indignantly and he deserves her he muttered under his breath charlie opened his eyes is she safe he asked starting up unscathed my son the cure said was this tailor man not his son had he not thirsted for his soul as a heart for the water brooks i am very sorry for you monsieur said charlie it is god's will was the reply in a choking voice it will be years before we have another church many many years the roof gave way with a crash and the spire shot down into the flaming debris the people groaned it will cost sixty thousand dollars to build it up again said filian lacasse we have three thousand dollars from the passion play said the notary that could go towards it we have another two thousand in the bank said maximilian cour but it will take years said the saddler disconsolately charlie looked at the cure mournful and broken but calm he saw the seigneur gloomy and silent standing apart he saw the people in scattered groups looking more homeless than if they had no homes some groups were silent others discussed angrily the question who was the incendiary that it had been set on fire seemed certain i said no good would come of the play-acting said the seigneur's groom and was flung into the ditch by philly and lacasse presently charlie staggered to his feet purpose in his face these people from the cure and seigneur to the most ignorant habitant were hopeless and inert the pride of their lives was gone gather the people together he said to the notary and philly and lacasse then he turned to the cure and the seigneur with your permission messieurs he said i will do a harder thing than i have ever done i will speak to them all wondering m loisel added his voice to the notary's and the word went round slowly they all made their way to a spot the cure indicated charlie stood on the embankment above the road the notables of the parish round him rosalie had been taken to the cure's house in that wild moment in the church when she had fallen insensible in charlie's arms a new feeling had sprung up in her she loved him in every fibre but she had a strange instinct a prescience that she was lying on his breast for the last time she had wound her arms round his neck and as his lips closed on hers she had cried 
we shall die together together as she lay in the cure's house she thought only of that moment what are they cheering for she asked as a great noise came to her through the window run and see said the cure's sister to mrs flynn and the fat woman hurried away rosalie raised herself so that she could look out of the window i can see him she cried see whom asked the cure's sister monsieur she answered with a changed voice he is speaking they are cheering him ten minutes later the cure and the notary entered the room m loisel came forward to rosalie and took her hands in his you should not have done it he said i wanted to do something she replied to get the cross for you seemed the only payment i could make for all your goodness to me it nearly cost you your life and the life of another he said shaking his head reproachfully cheering came again from the burning church why do they cheer she asked why do they cheer because the man we have feared monsieur mallard i never feared him said rosalie scarcely above her breath because he has taught them the way to a new church again and at once at once my child a remarkable man said narcisto finn there never was such a speech never in any courtroom was there such an appeal what did he do asked mademoiselle loisel her hand in rosalie's everything answered the cure there he stood in his tattered clothes the beard burnt to his chin his hands scorched his eyes bloodshot and he spoke with the tongues of men and angels said m dauphin enthusiastically the cure frowned and continued you look on yonder burning walls he said and wonder when they will rise again on this hill made sacred by the burial of your beloved by the christening of your children the marriages which have given you happy homes and the sacraments which are to you the laws of your life you give one twentieth of your income yearly towards your church then give one fortieth of all you possess to-day and your church will be begun in a month before a year goes round you will come again to this venerable spot and enter another church here your vows your memories and your hopes will be purged by fire all that you possess will be consecrated by your free-will offerings ah if i could but remember what came afterwards it was all eloquence and generous and noble thought he spoke of you said the notary he spoke the truth and the people cheered he said that the man outside the walls could sometimes tell the besieged the way relief would come never again shall i hear such a speech what are they going to do asked rosalie and withdrew her trembling hand from that of madame dugal this very day at my office they will bring their offerings and we will begin at once answered m dauphin there is no man in chaudier but will take the stocking from the hold the bag from the chest the credit from the bank the grain from the barn for the market or make the note of hand to contribute one fortieth of all he is worth for the rebuilding of the church notes of hand are not money said the cure's sister the practical sense ever uppermost they shall all be money hard cash said the notary the seigneur is going to open a sort of bank and take up the notes of hand and give bank bills in return to-day i go with his steward to quebec to get the money what does the abbey resignal say said the cure's sister our church and parish are our own interposed the cure proudly we do our duty and fear no abbey voila said m dauphin he never can keep his hands off i saw him go to joe portugais a little while ago remember he said i can't make out what he was after we have enough to remember to-day for sure good may come of it perhaps said m loisel looking sadly out upon the ruins of his church see tis is a sunrise said mrs flynn's voice from the corner her face towards the eastern window end of chapter fifty seven recording by tom weiss tom's audiobooks dot com